pada malam hari ini mungkin lebih banyak akan mengangkat tentang teknologi in design. Ada Mariana Cabugera sebagai senior architectural designer di Zadit Architect dan nanti ada Mingzo dari Envirotech Indonesia dan Envirotech Kreatif. Mas Kosya, I'll give him back to you again. The time is yours. Okay, thank you Brian. I would like to introduce uh, Ming first. Um, Ming Zhu is the founding partner of Enviro Tech Creative, uh, born in Singapore and graduated in Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Western Australia first. Ming was nominated for several architectural design awards and awarded the best graduation prize from Woods Vegas. After a year working at Woods Vegas first, she decided to join the family-owned architectural design practice Enviro Tech in Jakarta, Indonesia. One of her pivotal professional moments was creating a successful mixed-use development, Sahib Kuta Lassal Resort (SKLR) Beachwalk Bali, consisting of Sheraton Bali Kuta Resort and a garden, nest, rice field, inspired open retail lifestyle mall, which had high recommendation in World Architecture Festival in 2008. In 2020, Phase Two of SKLR was awarded Best Mix of. Best mixed use architectural design in Indonesia and Asia. Ming is passionate about encouraging the use of local material and craft in her design, part of her way to create social response and consciousness. Based in China since 2017, Ming stepped up the design game to deliver results and inject new identity to the brand range hotel she handled mostly with one of China's top hotel groups, Guangzhou Hotel Groups Limited. Ming's work explores the possibility of using synthetic rattan, metal sheet, and woods in various design scales in Indonesia. This draws our interest to know more how she combined craftsmanship, which has close relation with craftsmen, imperfection, and time-consuming, and industrial process, which heavily focus on machine precision and efficiency within her architectural project. So, uh, without further ado, let us welcome Ming Zhu. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, I would first like to say thanks to uh, Pat Lim for inviting me when he approached me to to give this webinar, and to all the sponsors like Pat Mulio and also Anabata for this opportunity. Um, actually, when I was reading on this topic, diversity on process, I had a um, Going through all the years, the 15 years of uh, being a designer, it was actually a very heartfelt moment during this uh, presentation. So, I would like to share design in a quite a different light and what Envirotech uh, is about. So, first of all, actually, um, it made me think of what is what is diversity? What is your diversity? What is our diversity? It goes back to a lot of inspirations. It's all about the humans. It's about the spatial. It's about scale. It's about needs. It's about how a space revolves around humans, basically, and that's what design is about. Um, Corbusier's uh, Brissolle buildings that he actually had a very strong social response of context, but it is needed at that time. And he talks a lot about proportions, about the human experience between buildings and spaces, and how do we actually incorporate perhaps other types of design like media and art, like Soul the Wit uh, in New York City. When I saw this in the train station, it had such dynamic impact on space. It could be as a simple thing as a piece, and how all these diverse needs and design can actually immerse into. Uh, A gathering and environment, and still growing organically. And a verse that I really like from Peter Zumthor, he says, "Every once in a while, I get this feeling of presence. Sometimes in me, but definitely in the mountains. If I look these rocks, these stones, I get the feeling of presence, of space, of material. And this is exactly when I look at this picture that I took in Bali. How everything has its own composition, has its own presence." But when it combines together, it gives you that sort of spiritual kind of experience of its textures and colors. So then, when we go back to our company in Varitech, it, it is actually a very old company. It's almost half a century old, fifty years old,、uh, created by、uh, 
uh, Mr. Chu in 1972. And then how we can see this brand and this company grew to a new rebranded brand. Um, and Verotech, and in last year in Shanghai during COVID, um, I actually set up a, a new entity of Verotech Creators with my business partner, Shun, where we wanted to do something a little bit more, which I will explain in my presentation later on. So ET, it just basically means environment and technology. And basically our three main ideas is the DHE, the design, it's all about the human centric and experience and how these three things together create a diverse ecosystem through process and through thought and progress. So seven of our basic design ethos is basically the user may be a he or she. How can they have an experience through design solutions and strategies? We are also a very big believer of sustainability, but not just design sustainability but the longevity of a product of a business model that is successful through multiple collaborations it could be your consultants it could be students it could be a different artist so we really believe in creating a design intention and what is its role and positioning and that equates to its output its percentage output and also, why do we always need to build new things? Why can't we look at old things, existing properties or assets or products for future enhancements which with new evolving programs? So this really makes you think how diverse design can be. And the coexistence with multi-layered collaboration of people, spaces and elements. And something we always believe in is a crafted moment. We craft every moment through a process of thought, logic flow and ultimately I think implementation is super important for a designer. From a paper to actually something built, that whole process is, is actually something that I think is quite lost these days, which is something that would be very good to bring back. And last of all, design for life, creative in life. Design is a life engaging, it's a long time process. Um, I was quite inspired by a talk by Virgil Abloh. Um, he, he is the founder of Off-White Brand, where basically in his TED talk for Harvard, he talked about people and about human interaction. And I feel that design creates this diversity through different touch points. It could be physical, it could be invisible, and a certain kind of emotional engagement and spatial relationship with the users. So it's all about humans. So how do we create design through process thought? So what is your process? So our creative system, we believe three things, observe, relevance, and presence. And in this, our creation value that um, I thought about it is, presence and relevance has to go together because it's currents and it's, it's value. But how do we create so-called value? And what is actually value? So the norm things like flow and logic, your solution strategy, your critical filtration is really at the lower spectrum. It's actually a norm. And in this middle, I believe we should have this diversity, but we need balance. And how this balance can bring design up to another level of what I called the DHE, the value which is very emotional and ultimately a human experience. So through our projects, I like to talk about in different scales, small, medium, large, and what's next. And in a lot of our projects, the touch points we have are like details, craft, process, scale, moments, brand identity. And we'd like to explore with different types of design disciplines. So it could be branding, it could be visual, it could be sculpture, it could be artwork. And then what's next is something that I will share later on, where we now want to create a kind of ecosystem with a lot of co-creation with our clients, co-collaboration with vendors, um, a lot of co-resourcing, data insights, and future systems. Because it's also happening because of COVID, it made us rethink a lot about um, design business and what's next for us and what's next for the future generation. So um, I'll start with small projects. It's probably something that um, I feel the most for. Actually, I think small projects really 
um, it's very heartfelt and there's a lot of things that uh, maybe Envirotech isn't known for but we actually do a lot of in-house products a lot of our brochures, collaterals, our furniture and also our design principle of sustainability so we do a lot of um, things in-house that creates a kind of a workplace culture and everything is eco from the architect's bag with Sawyer ink to a pencil case to our name cards to our placeholders for drawings in A3 and A4 sizes we are actually quite uh, very detail oriented and that actually brings us to our offerings such as the menus that we designed for a vegan restaurant in Singapore and even the rebranding of FX Mall that we were caught to rebrand their entire logo and bring life back into the brand and to our brochures and also in furniture and lighting um, we feel that there are little pieces that are placed in spaces that creates little touch points because you actually touch them and use them and in this particular project for a hotel in Shenzhen that we did last year uh, we created a series called the Feng Shui Marble Series which was to increase the experience of a hotel lobby and it was actually just using one material and it could be this and this able like this and engage and become sculptural pieces within the lobby itself where this render shows so it could be maybe used as a product display and it, it is something you can use as a functional piece and there's a two toner um, material and it's all about the craft so we work with a factory in in china to produce these pieces and eventually we um, it increases the experience in the hotel so every single thing that you place in, even the lighting, the way you, you choose your certain materials, your touch points, your design uh, ethos has to go back into your design principles, uh, such as this project that we did in uh, Bali. It's a yoga shala. We, so we chose a very upcycled and recycled materials. And also again, these, these are actually upcycled materials and lamps that we, uh, that we purchased from Bandung. And also, we have to actually do mock-ups and implementations on site to make sure that these proportions actually work and the user experience and the scale of things. So then we talk about moments and juxtaposition. It could be as simple as a color in the space and how things are put together. Um, this little moment, maybe a handle placed, the height, the little details of the cabinetry to using two-tone material to even art direction is something that we actually observe a lot and we create a lot in our projects so the next project i would like to share is a very very small project it's actually our own office in jakarta Pusat. so basically it's a 20 year old building and we decided to revamp and enhance the entire ground level so we stripped off this layer of wall it was it's a 20 year old wall a brick wall and we decided look we're just going to leave it it has history it has context it built this office and then we create it into an art gallery space to even creating um the entire space as more like a marketing showcase for our clients to understand what we provide as designers and services to the lighting to the door handle and even the this particular light that i really really like it's a very mechanical piece that we designed with the lighting consultant is to create a habit of eco-friendly to save electricity so everybody at the workplace has to switch it off before they leave the work so it this little touch points that we believe that we bring uh, even to creating an architect's table that we created for our studio uh, we work with a very talented furniture designer tabu in bali which have to think about transportation and also uh, the assemblage and and how how we operate so in the gist of all we do all sorts of stuff we do we do visuals we do marketing galleries and this is a, a lovely project that we just started on in jakarta for a private residence interiors and in, in hotels uh, and also some other uh, projects such as flagship stores for Nike. So a whole diverse range of projects that we do and we believe in the power of the sketch. We, I still think this is really powerful to create such moments. Um, in the Medium project that I would like to share, um, 
I'm sure maybe quite a few of you have noticed this building that just came out a few years ago. It's actually a very old building that our Singaporean client bought over. It's a nine story building um, and it actually uh, represents his company brand. So when I'm going back to the chart again of how we have to understand that the brand itself, what the client's brief wants as a foundation, because he actually sells uh, honey products. Hence, the entire project was based around one simple logic and one sim simple touch point, which is the hexagon shape. And how this he hexagon shape created our design touch points, our visuals, our signages, our interiors, our lighting, to even the content of the spaces because he wanted to create the whole building was his experience center. It was his brand marketing gallery. So there was a lot of testing of co-working spaces, communal spaces and rentable offices and how we actually managed to enhance a great B building to a great A office building. And eventually till now um, a human experience for his entire company. So it was a very interesting project we, what I want to show is more of how we enhance the building through production and through collaboration with our vendors. That was, this entire facade has 1,569 alicobon panels that we prefabricated in the factory and then installed on site in three months. And the whole project only took interior and architecture only took one year to finish so it was on crash course we had to do it we had to plan everything we had a very supportive client project manager and construction team and we actually uh, started the entire project from his idea of the honey so again going back to the concept of the mathematics of the hexagon how we translate that into the facade into the interiors and how we actually use materials and prefabrication as part of the entire implementation process. And here, um, understanding that craft and how do you use craft into implementation. So I'd like to show a little video quickly, uh, just to show how this entire process started for the community. And we had very talented architects working on this. Um, figuring out how to fix these panels onto an existing facade. So everything is a proportion and it's not just a hexagon, it's actually parts of a hexagon. And we collaborated with uh, a vendor into an origami shape and then it started and then we fold the panel across each of it and we attach each of the ends of the hexagon um, into the shape of the hexagon and even the the points of the structure is also hexagonal shape so it's really an amazing process how we actually thought of architecture in a different way um, and there's a sun shading fin and even the laser beams we use was also Hexagonal. Yeah, and then uh, another short video show about how we prefabricated all these uh, parts of timber and we installed on site in one week. So, understanding um, the process of the wood and how we use local resources to actually uh, stay in budget as well. So, I will make it faster to show you. Sorry, it's, not, it's actually the same. I think I loaded it. It's okay. I'll just move on because it's, um, it's a loaded long, long video. But anyway, what we had to understand was that the entire facade um, was in the hexagonal shape and what we had to do was to understand the existing structure had to hold this weight. So we had to actually create pieces and um, attaching each of these points 
into back into the beam. So we had to discuss with the structure engineer many, many rounds on the weight, whether it, this thing could hold, and also uh, to understand how uh, everything has to also still retain it within the budget. So then we created this little beauty. Um, it, it has a lot of programs in it, and how do we have such diverse programs uh, catered into such a building? So we had a marketing gallery, we had, uh, they had facial uh, uh, spaces for training center. We did all the signages and visuals and all the slogans. And then even to today, this became like a very important uh, icon for them. So we believe that if clients want to be the leader of a future experience, they will need to understand that a high quality experience of implementation is a, a long process. We have to work together as, as a team. So the next project I'll be talking uh, through is a project that we have worked on for 10 years. And this is uh, a project that involved many, many people, uh, many special tanks. Uh, we did the Sahit Kuta Lifestyle Resort Phase 1 and Phase 2 just completed last year. We did the entire master planning from ground zero, there was nothing on site. We did the architecture, the interior, the landscaping. And this is in 2013 when we took this picture. And then this is this is uh, 2021, the, the second phase. And it was a collaboration between the, a very uh, far-sighted developer. Um, they want to create something out of the box. Um, and it was in Bali, mind that. It was a uh, challenging culture as well. But we managed to create uh, an iconic destination, if you like, internationally, because this, this project was even featured in Tourism Board uh, in, 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 uh, in Bali, uh, in Indonesia. So it was, um, it was a project that spanned over 10 years. And in 2019, we actually had a seven-year cycle for the mall. We had a major revamp. And in 2017, we were engaged to do the second part. So it's huge. It's almost 100 over 1,000 square meters of space built. It was probably the single largest construction and development in Bali at that time and even last year. But this is what we get. It was a project or is the project created for people. The people like this, moments like that, and even people on the street. And how we actually changed the entire scape of Kuta. Because if you, went, if you go to Kuta 10 years ago, it was very dark, it was quite dangerous, and it was completely quite messy. And what the developer did was this 250 meter stretch of Kuta Road, we clean it up. We beautify it, we work with the government, we clean up the traffic. It, it was walkable, it's nice. And what we had to do was to engage the Kuta flow and the poppy lanes and people to congregate and go into the property. So it was always the building was never about building. It was always about the spirit of the experience. When you look at the word beach walk, you walk on the sand, under the sun, you touch the sea, you smell the air. It's an experience amalgamation of all these experiences of, ex of the activities. And what we actually created was this crazy curvature. So we talk about fluidity in architecture. To me, this is fluidity in architecture. The organic forms became the identity of beach walk. It became the brand. So at any corners of beach walk you see is an iconic photo. And of course, it came from the traditional concept of the trianga, which is the, the legs, the body and the head. And that's how the entire project is based on and the colors of nature. And then we talk about the experience, the center, the oasis of this whole urban. We created a new typology, a new energy, where the entire development was raised up by 1.2 meters. I remember because at every point you could actually see the sea. And 203 room keys, every room had a sea view. So these are just the premise and the site 
process. I remember at, at that time when I went to the site, there was over, I think, a thousand people because we had to dig two levels of basement down for the for the parking. People were just using their hands to, to do um, the rebar. It was really an amazing site for me and these are probably photos not seen very often. Um, so we also focus a lot about landscape understanding this project really made me understand about the type of landscape the heights the density the colors and also uh, plants that can be used in sea condition and they become very soft barriers we don't need a railing we actually use landscape as for privacy and beauty and also two very important touch points was the ascension into this part. Then where we expand the space and then we go into contraction and then we expand back into the oasis. And of course, beach walk as an icon for visual. Early sketches, we wanted to create a retail spaces that was completely not box. It was elliptical shape. And at that time, I know we had a lot of challenges from the developer, from the marketing, from the operator. They were saying, are you crazy? Who is going to rent this space? But you know what? After going rounds of massaging with them, we realized that the lip shape became the icon because then we create a new typology of a fluid short front, which is continuously um, visually accessible at all edges. There was no hard edge. So that really fits into the program and the spatial experience. And then what we created was actually indoor and outdoor alfresco area, which became extended rentable area for the developer, which was a completely new idea at the time. So the, the middle pots were actually um, little lily pots, if you like. And then we actually created very very raw it was a very raw project because we had a very low budget for for the interior and we wanted to keep it locally sourced so if you look at these very early pictures was about how we managed to create an experience space that's very expensive it was all about the indoor and the outdoor and spaces for the people a lot of hand sketches we also talk about design sustainability. The entire property only use LED lights. And even in the morning, we do not need to switch on the lights. The entire place is naturally ventilated by the natural air going through the oasis. And if you look at this little section that's done by Pajani, one of our amazing uh, drawer, these are little airflow gaps that the heat will actually escape. And another important feature that we actually created was this precast GRC module of two meters long uh, that we actually created a, a casting panel. What, and this little section here is the most important section in the development where the plant, uh, the Li Guan Yu plant actually grows over it. But we created this little air gap here, if you like, to, to release the heat so it will not burn the plant during very hot Bali days. So we thought about the MEP system, the whole building system, we talked about the drainage, and we talked about even hiding LED lights within this feature. So a lot of process uh, and a lot of thought given into it, and this is what we created. This green belt became the icon, and even the green belt around the pond is an entire overflow drainage system for the pond. And we wanted to keep everything local, so we cast everything on site to all the terrazzo flooring. Uh, and we use very, very simple material because it was the best cooling material. If you go to a lot of the old Bali or tropical houses, we use a lot of cement aggregate. So understanding your local trade, your recycled materials, on-site application, prefab, we created this. Other moments, such as um, the Sheraton Bali, and uh, with all the sky gardens and all the different moments that we created. So with this, we believe that um, the co-creation between the developer and all their teams were very pertinent in the success because we grew together actually as a whole team. And that's why in phase two, it was a different experience. Phase two, I felt that we were an armored team. We were ready to take new challenges and it was an oasis but in an internalized experience because this was actually the old Harris Hotel Kuta. So they bonkai everything and they built three new properties. There was an Aloft Hotel, a Yellow Hotel, 
and a private 36 rooms residence and an amazing new urban sanctuary. So we talk about going back to this, this again, we talk about the brand and this time, as I said, we in integrated the client's operation and marketing team way at the front. So we co-create new tenant guidelines with them. I think this is very, very important. We don't just work on a brief, we work as a team. And we also identified our target audience, who will be going to the new Beach Walk Bali. And then we talk about the des design touch points and also many, many collaboration. One of them is BioLiving. Uh, with uh, providing the stage uh, ceiling for us and we also have uh, a collaboration with this amazing upcycled straw board supplier from China where we fabricated everything in the China um, factory and sent it over to Bali uh, before COVID. So that content, we wanted to give a different offering so we actually came up with a whole branding deck for the, the, the for the for the project and we want to go localized so there was a lot of local curated tenants as main tenants so the developer can do a lot of collaboration with them and we also realized that it's because of this they survived in COVID because there was a lot of offline and online integrations between the shops and also one very important element was the greeting point where we created there was a service customer service uh, at the drop-offs. So the idea was actually this, it was a cave, but then you looked up, you see the sea, when you look down, you actually have a private beach. And don't forget about Kuta's beautiful sunset colours. So we want to create something that's vibrant, a place where people want to go and to hide away or to socialise. So it was a new urban sanctuary and this was the deck we created for the developer and if you look at all the colors it was not just a design concept it was a marketing deck they could use to go and approach their tenants so we had to also think about the premise between the new and the old development how do we link the two parts together how do we link the two nexus together this was very important so it was two oases of a two different roles and positioning and some of the elements that we kept was the green belt and we wanted a growing platform. So this time it grows vertical. We, we brought the landscape vertical up to the facades. So that was something different. So if we go back to this little sketch that our managing director did, we had a heart of experience again of, at all sites. All the tenants have a beautiful view towards the center oasis. And at the center of it, we have a stage for performance and for communal gathering. And this, what I call is actually um, a horizontal of visual, spatial and green experience. It overflows. It's a very space, but visually you can see from one end to the other end. Then that was very important to break up the spaces. Then it goes vertical. It goes up the facade where we had three different buildings of three different nature three different operators but then we had to actually engage them as a whole development so this was actually very challenging for us and then i call this entire experience from the center it vibrates out there's rings of layered experience you see we have the first lower ring the stage then we have the green belt and then we have the facade so that was really amazing how we actually flow everything together and these are actually glass bridges across the garden podium where there's water on it and these are actually where all the drop-offs are. So I just sh quite show uh, maybe a four minute video because the process was too long but I wanted to share um, actually the entire design concept so you get a feel of how much sweat and you know uh, blood we put into this entire thing so yeah. And the colors that we used um, in, in the entire presentation was back to the brand, the five colors of Beach Walk. So we had a lot of process, we had a lot of sketches, uh, designing the entire thing. Um, and also even the Oasis itself, we had so many iterations of it, uh, working with the marketing people, how to make it work 
how to make it economically viable and with all the operators um, for the facades so we created um, very raw materials very simple materials and we let the landscape uh, talk for itself And even right at the front, for the tenant guidelines, we had to even place where the kitchen is because they had to start selling the spaces. So designing a, a retail space is not, not that simple. You, had, you have to think of a lot of uh, different um, expectations from different tenants and from the operators. And then the renders for the marketing brochures was done uh, by someone else. But it shows at least the entire development of uh, different areas and moments. And this is an interesting part. We were engaged to do an entire tenancy guideline. So the types of shops that can come in, the scale, the signages, the types of font, the furniture, uh, the materials to be used. So then we could work directly with the tenants uh, for them to follow the kind of guidelines we want so it does not turn out to be very messy. So I think this was a very good experience uh, collaboration between the marketing and operation and us and we learned a lot actually from, from this process. Uh, and with this, uh, I think uh, if you guys have a chance to visit uh, the new beach walk, you could see a lot of this new um, guidelines in there. And we even designed the signage um, where with the stroke of, uh, of the, the water and the stroke of the actual building itself. So this, this was based on um, all the requirements from the maintenance, uh, we talk about the lighting, the materials, all the interior and exterior signages and we have to also understand what they need to show people in terms of the visual engagement. So I think that that was uh, a very important process for us to understand the scale of things, where people look and how visually it can guide people as well. And where to place them actually. So um, this, this is actually quite a lot of technicality and a lot of mock-ups. So it was also part of the upgrading process for Beach Rock 1. So we want a consistency between the aesthetic between Beach Rock 1 and 2. Of course, advertisement along the street and the materials. And this this is what, what currently it is right now. And online integration with the client. Yep. And then um, I'll quickly move on. I'm just worry about the time. Uh, sorry. So I want to talk about behind the scenes which I think is something that is left out a lot in project. Um, whenever I see all these pictures in few few alive that you can actually build something out of nothing. And this is the power of design, of an architect, of a designer. And thank you to the team uh, behind that built all these things, to the Envirotech team, to the developers team, to the project on site, to create experience through all this selection of different materials and it happened during COVID. So the construction at the last stage, I remember it was crazy because no one could visit the site. We had to do everything online from approvals, selection, and you know, so we, so we found ways to actually create uh, mock-ups. And this is a very interesting material that we use for the entire ceiling. It, was, it is a non formidahyde a recycled straw board from waste, from straw waste, from rice waste. So I found this supplier in China. He's a Singaporean guy who invented this for 10 years. And we prefabricated everything in China. And then we installed on site. And we even did a life-size mock-up. 
it was crazy. I went to the factory in Jiangsu for, for this. And this is how it looks like uh, right now. So it's completely safe. It's a good branding point for the developer, non formidable high and safe. And then the first touch point I would like to talk about is the counter. We actually decided that customer needs the experience, the experience of being greeted, you know, and coming to a mall that's something that you can see. Then we created this kind of uh, waffle slap feature where if you remember the glass uh, water walkway above, so you can get the experience of the water, the sun shining through. So the entire spatial experience is amazing. And the second touch point is the stage, the illuminated stage that we created. And fortunately, um, when I found BioLiving, um, this material, I really loved it. I decided that we got to use this material for the stage because it had such it had such natural and such um, elemental feel to it. And I was so big on, you know, the whole sustainability thing. So we did a lot of sketches, a lot of going back and forth during COVID. I remember doing WhatsApp to create this. And all the detailing on site and the team to try to put it together uh, with, uh, uh, with precision. I, I think we were very happy with uh, the outcome of it. And obviously, the, sec the third touch point is the breeding green facade. When we created the facade, it was based on choosing the right plants for the different facades. And it was about the frame view. So this is a, re this is a photo I asked someone to take today. I think the, the landscape is going really nicely uh, right now. Um, and with the different facades, we wanted to uh, keep it uh, its brand identity. Like for example, Yellow Hotel, we purposely wanted yellow frames for the door to express its its identity. And for A Love, we wanted something that's sleek. So we use a lot of wooden strips to create that frame view. But each of these elements are actually accentuated by a very very big balcony. Uh, it was a big deep overhang. It's almost like an extension of your living area. So this was the highlight because you get a 360 degrees view of the oasis. And these are just other moments uh, pre-opening. And also uh, simple uh, corridor spaces where we use a lot of perforated concrete bricks to express uh, the Balinese culture. And this shot I really like. I think this was something that we created, a sky jogging track. Uh, for the customers uh, staying in the hotels and this idea came out from the developer because we had such beautiful space above so they were saying why don't we connect the three buildings with a jogging track and then last day we actually won um, a award of, with the uh, for, for a property guru for the best architecture mixed use so we we're quite happy with that and this is how it is like today so what's next? Um, we created Envirotex Creatives last year in Shanghai uh, with my partner Shen. We wanted to do something different. We wanted to create a system, the DHE system, with more digital and more data insights. We believe that this entire system here of work, live, learn, whatever it is that you want, is actually, we really need a lot of digital because things are accelerating now. We also need to think about how to join them together into this complete ecosystem and to create a good product experience. So we started a lot of projects now working with a lot of developers with envisioning stage. It's pre-design stage. It's actually more on product development, brand research, a little bit of what BioLiving does with product research. We create a lot of playbooks for them um, and also thinking about their operation strategies to even using data insights. So I'd like to illustrate uh, with some of the projects we're doing currently in China. For example, this project in Nantong, the developer owns uh, the entire building and the mall around it. So what we wanted to create is a hub zone between the office, his HQ, with a hotel, with the lobby, and how this entire is, is actually linked together and run together with an app as well. So we, want, we created his HQ, we did all the interior, but we also created his operation strategies and part of his uh, HQ has co-working spaces so he could rent out the spaces to other enterprises. So then we co-create with other companies as well. 
And then we also did the hotel interior within the building. It was a Spanish brand called Basilo. And we create we wanted a hospitality aspect to it. So if you imagine people going uh, to work in a certain region in China, let's say they come to this building, they could just stay here, they could go upstairs to, to, to work. So it's an entire system and you don't even need to leave the building. So this is something that we're trying to create right now with a lot of concept and visioning work that we're doing for a lot of developers um, in strategies and design and also um, creating a prototype development and even going into interviews and target audiences and working with a super talented uh, collaborator, CVI, for data insights. So we collect, we scrape a lot of data now and using this data, it ha actually helped us inform our design even better. So this is something that uh, we are exploring right now uh, and um, something we would like to focus on as well as not just the design part. And also we do a lot of um, research and even doing investor deck. For example, for our client, he's an entrepreneur. He wants to create a brand called WeLearn. So we create an investor deck for him to pitch to investors and doing space modules, space configurations to the brand identity and to the experience of the product. Then going back into ET, we also have our own future systems and communication tools. If not, we cannot operate in three different regions. We are in China, we're in Indonesia, and our managing director is in Singapore. So we use a lot of online management systems of diverse range to help us. One of them that we're building right now is a vendors platform. We believe that vendors are very important in our implementation. And that's why I thought this talk was really, really important because we got to work with people, we got to use our resources as well as our resources to collaborate for quick reach. So we're trying to, trying to create a vendor system where you can have a quick reach and maybe perhaps in the future, it could be an open source system where suppliers can even engage themselves into our system and put up all the stock lists, the price lists, because I feel that a lot of our time are spent just calling up, you know, like weeks after weeks, we have to chase them. So then we, we created this system for ourselves, for, for our projects. And other systems that we're using are our management for our project overviews, our data insights on timesheets, managing our team in Indonesia and our team in China, and even creating our own digital assets for our furniture, for our products. So everything is online, but then we also do do, do sketches. And also something uh, that we're using to collaborate with our client now through design apps, where we actually let our client go onto our design board online and we comment. It's a bit scary because you actually open up your you're being transparent to your client. But then I feel after a few rounds, it actually creates trust and a better relationships with your client, engaging them in the co-creation of processes. Yeah. So um, yeah, I end my talk with this um, cute little prototype that we did for WeLearn. And yeah, I hope you enjoy my talk. Okay, thank you very much yeah. for the amazing presentation. It's quite thank a lot you. to digest. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Happens. Sorry, maybe maybe I ran a bit over time. Yeah. No, no, but it's okay. We are on the on the last batch, so uh, we can okay. always extend the, the time if the audio, audience a lot. Um, uh, we get a couple of questions, but uh, first of all, I, I would like to ask a, a little, maybe more uh, personal question as a designer. Sure. Uh, you were really interested in the, in the craftsmanship, and mm. uh, we know that uh, craftsmanship is really doing uh, something with your hand, hand in hand with the materials, and then more into creating stuff, making, uh, let's say, um, not uh, human to human, but the human to product or to material. Mm. Then uh, on the larger scale, uh, your work uh, start to shift it. Uh, it's more about human to human interaction rather than really hand in hand into the design because of, of course of the scale and the process and the speed and so on and so on. So um, I would like to ask, how do you feel about it? I mean, uh, is there any special um, special value that you bring from 
uh, crafting with uh, materials into crafting connection with humans, for example, or maybe you can explain a little bit more on that. Um, yeah, it's a very, very good question, actually, because I feel that even this craft is a process for us because we, we are all architects, right? Architects, you know, we, we just draw and draw and we detail. When we kind of have this craft, then you start to think that it is actually your base for everything you do. It could be, like I said, design a furniture, a product or everything. But then we start to realize that what is the most important thing is the human to human experience, which is something that perhaps not, um, I think not all designs actually uh, touch that. And it's something that we want to bring it closer to the product itself as well. Because when you create this human and human touch, you actually feel it. Then you will understand how humans move in a space how spatially they will actually engage with your product. And that becomes another research and another kind of test for you as a designer as well. I think it's, it's very important. And it's something that's very big because everybody has different experiences. Everybody experience, uh, perceives space indifferently. But I think this is also something that's uh, very interesting and we're trying to do more and more of it. So the base craft is always there, it's never gone. It's, it's just that we are going, like I say, the vibration, right? We just go out, yeah. Okay. Very nice. Um, I, I will go forward with the uh, question from Junior Moises. Hello, Miss Ming. First of all, I really appreciate the craftsmanship, especially those shown in the small project. The juxtaposition of pieces is so natural. In terms of larger scale project, how do you or your team respond mm. to practicality, sustainability, and craftsmanship, if it's applicable to be all together in one project? Um, it's, a, it's a very big challenge because it goes back to your design ethos that I shared. As a designer, you need to understand your value, what you want to push. And in every project that you do, it might not be perfect but it is actually another experience for yourself as a designer to actually uh, have sustainability and to have craft and to have even good implementation sometimes you need a little bit of good luck <laughs> with the contractor but then it depends on how you build relationships i think with your client and with your collaborators which is something i think designers need to do a lot you need to communicate more, you need to bring your ideas, you need to actually go for the game. You need to convince your client that this actually works. So a lot, part of being a designer is not just creating a beautiful picture, it's actually how you be able to convince people that this beautiful picture will bring you much more value as I showed, the emotion and engagement in your projects. And of course, it goes without saying there's a lot of hard work because you can't detail everything. So you need, to, you need to know your main touch points, as I say. You need to know what you want to go for in a space. So you could have a few moments in your space that you really focus on and you really bring that out in your project to try to bring all these elements that you want in that touch point. And I think if you just succeed in one touch point, I think it's good enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hope it answers your question. Yeah. I hope it's answered. Uh... The question for Junior. So we're uh, moving to another uh, question. Maybe this time we, we can ask Lidvi to unmute. Uh, Lidvi, hello. Hi. Uh, hi, Lidvi. Uh, do you want to ask uh, Ming directly? Okay. Uh, uh, let's move to another question. Uh, Brian, uh, do, do you want to add something? No, 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 no. I just want to uh, ask Litwi to unmute, but I think maybe... Um, okay, maybe uh, Mas Gosia can next to the Q&A box. Okay. Well, this one from Anonymous Attendee. Uh, this is a bit more detailed. Mm. Uh, he's asking about the project in Kuta. Uh, is there any special 
treatment for hotel and private residence facade, which facing to awful stage related to noise, privacy, etc. I think it's the um, second phase. Uh, what you, uh, yeah. What I think you cannot block out hundred percent. I would say that if you like to be the in the vibrant of this space. Sometimes you got to accept certain noise levels. So I wouldn't say it's 100%. But I would say that uh, using proper double glazing uh, glass doors uh, uh, and proper channels, that will help a lot in that, which we used. And also I feel that the deep overhangs with the plants actually help a lot as soft barriers for sound insulation as well. And we use a lot of soft materials like wood and of course with concrete. They are all absorbing. So the entire mall actually, the panels for the straw boards, they are very good sound absorption panels. So hopefully that will bring down the noise level in the malls as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a bit unrelated with the question, but I really like the detail that you have with the Lee Kuan Yew. And mm. the edge of the building with the soffit, that you, you put a gap on it to reduce yeah. the overheat of the soffit. That's really smart uh, way of dealing with that. I know, like a couple of people, I think we saw some projects trying to emulate that. Um, and then we saw the plants died. Why? Because they forgot mm. that plants need to breathe. It's very yeah. hot in Bali, especially midday. They scorch the plants. So you've got to understand every single element you use. Then you create the detail, yeah. We still love that too. <laughs> it's like our go-to, it's like our money detail. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you can go a little bit more expensive on that because it's worth it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. oh, oh, you mean? Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry, come again? Oh, no, it's okay. I thought you were going to ask me to explain it. Okay. okay. Uh, is there any other question from the audience? No. Okay, uh, not so much. Uh, there's one from co-host. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, uh, will you be? Uh, will you understand me if I ask you in Indonesia? Uh, yeah, sure. Bole, bole, coba. Okay, bole. let's give it a try. <laughs> okay, let's do it. I think this is from uh, Brian. Saya titip satu pertanyaan. Apakah ada perbedaan dalam pendekatan desain and fire attack dari sebelum sebelum uh, ini? Maybe before you join the and fire attack hmm. uh, and now after you join the and fire attack. Um, like I say, it was a very it's a very old firm. So obviously, it has gone through 50 years of change. So I joined the company uh, 16 years ago. Um, I saw the change in not just uh, refining our design ethos and values, but also I think reduction of design. Because you know, architects in the past they used to have a lot of forms and form fun fo follow function as very fancy. I think we we started to focus on what we are really good at and the craft. The detailing is something that we always will still retain. So I think it grew in a, in a very different way, but we, there was still certain foundations you keep because they are your core values, right? And that's what, what makes uh, the design. But I think we, we are getting more innovative because now we are even going into digital systems where we're working a lot with data uh, insights people who are also architects uh, sharing different insights and I think it's a great time. It's so exciting, you know, how many people, talented people you can collaborate with to make your design even better. So it's a day of not just one architect as the master builder, but of many builders, I think, to create to create something different. Yeah. So it's, it's a new age. Lah. Yeah. The age of co-creation, you may say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look for us for collaborations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we would like to ask one last question, maybe, if there's no other hand, uh, question from the audience. Sure. Um, do you have any uh, instance on, on how you work with this uh, data bank and start to create uh, evaluation system, uh, something like that? Because 
the, the slide that you show us was really brief and uh, a lot of things happening. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know more. What, what uh, maybe you can, you can tell us one instance on uh, how you deal with that. Uh, so basically, one of our collaborators, he used to work for Acom, mm -hmm. and then he, so he's actually an architect, but he was very interested in data. And it's not just collecting whatever data, it's very specific. For example, one of our projects that we're doing now is on the street research. So basically, we need information of the type of people, the type of audience, um, how much they spend in a certain street. What is the population age? What is the age group? These things we need to scrape because they are exact uh, information that you get. With this Im information as the base, it actually helps you design even better because you, you don't design out of nothing anymore. You're basing on certain uh, statistics on information, even though it's not 100%, but it's at least giving you a direction. So we're doing a lot of these things now. Yeah, to even maybe, um, I think... There's one even how much the spending income of the age group because it really helps you to know what kind of sh shops you want to open in a certain street, for example, you see. So then data becomes very valuable. Yeah, so we have ways of uh, uh, doing that uh, and we really enjoy this process as well because it makes us realize that while wow, there's a lot of buildings or uh, design that has done before that, it's just in the end, it's a white elephant. That's why I, I, I believe that we, if we want to build something, it has to be meaningful. It, it has to mean something. And we hope that it can bring profit to the client. I think that that's very important too. The economics, the economy of things. I think this is something that we need to, uh, yeah, we need to understand as a designer. Yeah, so uh, you're bringing a more precise target to look at uh, for the client. Yeah, yeah. We even we even show down all this uh, analysis and charts of the data, uh, and even certain parameters. We have to set parameters because there's so much data. We have to set certain parameters you want. For example, what's the age group, right? Uh, uh, what what kind of uh, spending power and what radius? What's the radius? Is it five kilometers? Is it ten kilometers? The average. So that changes again. Uh, again, yeah, because in, so we're doing a lot of data scraping in China, but it's, it's, it's such a big region. So you kind of also need to understand which certain parameters you want to set first. And that it will also set uh, a parameter for our design as well, kind of like uh, 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 to analyze from that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very, very interesting. interesting. Yeah, it's very super interesting for us too. We, we love it. Yeah. Okay, so, so now we get another uh, three questions, so it's oh. uh, getting warmer here. <laughs> uh, maybe I would like uh, I would like to ask Nauri first, and then the second I would uh, take the question from Ben Saraswati, and then uh, Nathani and Nadia will be the third. Okay, I know Ben. Okay, <laughs> uh, Nauri, please, uh, you're free to uh, ask. Nauri, or uh, maybe, maybe we can move to Natania. Natania first. Please, Natania. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you, Ming, for the presentation. I really want to ask you because because you already work in uh, some project in Indonesia. Mm. And I want to ask you what factor of Indonesia that can be maximized, maybe, based on your perspective. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks uh, for the question. I think it's a very simple but very good question. A lot of challenges uh, to actually um, to build in Indonesia. Not that there's not enough craft. I just feel that um, um, there is always a lack of uh, there's always a lack of an enthusiasm in certain ways and efficiency. So I think if you want to work in Indonesia. My plan is you must always have different options and backup plans, like backup A, B, C, D. If this doesn't go this way, you better have something else because it's never definite. But then it makes you think as a designer, what all options are there and which is the best. Um, I think something that can improve 
uh, is a lot of government support and body support. I think especially to bring vendors and designers uh, together, not just selling a product, but I think to increase the knowledge of materials, how to implement, how to install, very basic practical things that we never had a lot of information from. We had to actually do it from work. We make a mistake, then we know, oh, okay, we won't do it that again. So what's a faster and more efficient way to do it? So there are a lot of challenges. So I think, yeah, I think a lot of bodies, uh, government bodies or organizations, I think it would be great if there's a bit more uh, support on that as well. And I think more of this kind of talk to bring people together, you know, to share ideas, I think is, is also very lacking uh, in Indonesia as well. Um, there are a couple, but I think it should be uh, a bit more uh, on the front and also with technology. Because after working in China, I'm just shocked at how fast things are here. Like just now when Pak Mulio was sharing about SPC, um, they are also heavily using SPC in China. And it's so, it is so widely used now, probably. Um, I, I'm not sure about the grade, there's different grades, but can you imagine their technology and their fast manufacturing and production, they are going to eat up the whole world. So we got to catch up. I mean, this is this part of the world that's really scary. They're so fast and they're very hardworking. So I think there's a few factors that we really need to reach out. We need to bring more good products into Indonesia as well, uh, cross countries. So I, I'm actually very grateful because we got a chance to work in China, getting China projects. And then the team in Indonesia, my Jakarta team, are actually working on Chinese projects. And you know what? They're even translating into Chinese language now. They have to attend meetings. So I think it's a way of leveling yourself up as well, not just a designer, but actually of a bigger scale. Yeah. So I hope that, that, that answers your, your, your question. Yeah. Okay, uh, now we're going to move to a question from Ben Saraswati. Hi Ming, what difference you felt very challenging during your SKLR project phase one compared to the phase two? <laughs> um, my own experience, because when I did SKR one, I was um, pretty young, I was 29. So, um, very young architect, designer. Um, so there's a lot of things that we overlook or we didn't think about, we had to learn. But I feel the most challenging thing was um, creating something new and innovative to convince your client. Uh, we had a lot of challenges from the feedback from marketing and operation as well. So we had to learn from that. Uh, so during phase two, I think it was a, sm a smoother delivery because everybody grew together, you see. We went through all the mistakes together. So we kind of knew that to build this new thing, there are certain things we'll avoid. Um, and then we also pre-discussed everything, especially like tenant spaces, how much you want to rent out. You know, all these things were really fixed. So we don't have to do so many changes later on during construction, which we did in phase one, especially with the tenant shops. Because it was the first project of such big retail spaces, it was crazy, it was like 50,000 square meters, you know. Can you imagine you have to rent everything out? So it was, it was a stress on the developer as well, I can understand that. And it was a stress on us because we were like, oh my God, this idea had to work, right? So there was a lot of refinement in between. We had, we had to adjust and also about the material, the, some of the materials actually um, didn't maintain very well, didn't last very well. But then in the end, we then decided in phase two what not to do anymore and what to do. So I think it was... Um, uh, challenging in, in, in a lot of ways, but I think SKR2 we have a very strong team uh, and I think they did so well in COVID, like I, I couldn't imagine they, they opened this during COVID, it was it was quite challenging. So um, yeah, SKR2 was much, I think much, <laughs> much more than <sunlight. laughs> SKR1 and also because we had very uh, more experience, yeah, there was trust, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know Ben. Oh, okay. Ben is. Yes, he's 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 <laughs> the project manager of Escara. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a tricky question. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, nice. I already get a signal from uh, Brian to wrap up uh, okay. the the session, but 
if you allow me, Brian, we can have one more question from Abli Made Agus Megapati. Yes, of course. This is for okay. last. Okay, let's 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 I'll get to the last one. Yeah, please, uh, Abli Made, you can unmute the mic. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay. If uh, okay. There's no response. Then okay. <laughs> I guess uh, we should wrap things up. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Okay, Ming. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I think we uh, learn a lot from what you uh, give us tonight. That um, no a lot of the a, a good uh, project can uh, can be comes out from uh, really uh, how to say the more uh, intricate process within it uh, whether it's uh, on a smaller scale uh, with the material or also the uh, intricate process with the people who work around the, the whole project uh, be it the developer be it the uh, tenants and uh, also the the attendants the, the, the one who experienced the space uh, yeah. so uh, uh, by that is um, now um, because there's so many things happening and all of our world can be collected in a really uh, big information at the bank. Uh, it can be used to sharpen or uh, sorry, uh, make uh, our design more effective by uh, using or pulling this data uh, and then develop it as a, a starting point for a strategically doing the whole design process in a larger scale commercial project. And uh, by that, uh, I guess, uh, uh, so end the second session we have tonight. Uh, thank you, Ming, for the really, uh, really interesting uh, session. And uh, I hope you uh, best of luck for the SKRL2 project. <laughs> and. Uh, I'll see you later then. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>